So I'm very happy to be here today, uh, this morning, uh, to talk about uh, confidential computing and containers. So my name is Magnus. I've been doing, working with containers for many years, and um, confidential computing is something I started roughly a year and a half ago. And um, in my current role at Microsoft, the software engineer, I'm working in the Azure Core Linux team, and we um, are working on um, uh, reconciling open source projects with uh, the solutions that Azure provides uh, in this space. Uh, so the first question I think uh, we need to discuss is uh, why confidential computing? Uh, essentially, confidential computing is a CPU-aided encryption technology that enables uh, us to run applications that process um, uh, sensitive data with a trusted execution environment. We'll talk later about what this means. Um, a term that often is uh, associated with this is uh, enclave. So it's pretty much um, the idea that you isolate something from a larger uh, computing context. And uh, confidential computing in this sense uh, is relying on a physical root of trust um, that is an authoritative source uh, which guarantees the confidentiality and the integrity of uh, a given workload that you employ in a trusted execution environment. And when we talk about integrity, um, this means uh, no one has tampered uh, with your data, and confidentiality basically means that no one uh, is eavesdropping uh, on your computations. Um, the whole thing is motivated uh, by a couple of use cases. I think the uh, obvious one is that uh, it enhances uh, data privacy and um, gives us guarantees about integrity. I think especially in Europe, um, uh, we're very familiar with uh, regulations like GDPR. So to be compliant um, with uh, those regulations uh, in the cloud um, uh, is not trivial and uh, confidential computing is a technology that aims to enable this. Uh, furthermore, there's a couple of uh, specific use cases that uh, involve, for example, um, I know, shipping large language models in a kind of black box to a customer, uh, multi-party computations, if you think about uh, supply chains that involve several parties and, and two perform computations on this data, you don't want to necessarily share um, with your partners um, everything in your supply chain. And for me personally, uh, there's a, an example. I've, I've been working in the mobility industry uh, for quite some time, and uh, in the electronic ticketing systems and the information systems, there's a huge amount of data that is produced. And uh, this is potentially very useful in, in um, planning for uh, utilization uh, for vehicles and, and I know, bus routes and enhancing services for the customers in general. But it's very hard, uh, in, in Germany at least, to, to um, use this data because this is from the nature of this data is very sensitive. You essentially have A, B um, uh, travel patterns from the individual users of uh, mobility services. Um, so in essence, this meant often th this data would be left in data lakes and uh, purged uh, after a while because it was very cumbersome to anonymize them or pseudonymize the data in a way that you can uh, retrieve insights. And confidential enclaves could be a way to leverage this kind of uh, uh, data treasure um, to say we are actually not interested who the actual user is and we are able to perform some joints on tables, uh, but it's not uh, we as um, uh, the ones who deploy the software don't necessarily have access uh, to those um, joint information, but only the insights that are derived from this. <coughs> 
the confidential computing principles, I think, um, I mean, you can slice it in different ways. What I would point out as uh, key elements are essentially the, the encryption of data and use, the, the principle of measurements and remote attestation. And I think we uh, probably want to go into detail on each of those. So I think the first one is a graph that um, folks that uh, have seen talks in this space probably have seen a lot of uh, slides that look like this. Essentially, um, the point is that we have like three pillars that would be data at rest, data in transit, and data in use. And uh, data at rest is, for example, I know the, the data that is encrypted in your um, database. Uh, data in transit is uh, TLS connections uh, between our services, and those two have been uh, today um, put into practice in pretty much uh, all important deployments and are pretty um, comfortable to use these days. What remains is the data in use. Um, that is a harder problem. This is pretty much the, um, uh, the CPU is processing our data. And in this uh, process, if you think about a cloud provider, um, uh, an administrator who has access to, to the hypervisor could uh, extract um, data from the uh, guest virtual machines that are spawned. And this is like not just memory, there's also CPU registers, there's caches, um, and essentially this whole block of um, computation is not guarded today. It's, it's a very uh, tricky problem. And confidential computing aims to close this gap. So again, um, here's a yeah, trivial chart of uh, what is meant by um, securing data and use. Um, so it's not pinned to a I know, certain CPU or certain cache. Um, it really has to build into the processor to, um, I know, when doing interrupts, evict certain data so it's not accessible uh, to neighbors or uh, cloud hosters. And as I said, like it could be um, extracted by platform owners, but also just malicious actors that hack uh, the platform. And the mitigation is to isolate uh, the memory and all the CPU states from the rest uh, of the platform. And for this, um, there has to be a piece of hardware um, uh, that performs this, and this we can call a secure processor. So the next pillar would be um, the measurements. So measurements is essentially uh, term that means we um, are hashing uh, uh, a bunch of code um, because uh, hashing is um, a one-way function, so it's virtually impossible to, to invert this and produce um, a piece of software that is matching this hash. And if we look at uh, a simplified Linux boot model, um, we can see um, how a chain of events can be measured. So if we start at the hardware, we are loading the firmware, and we perform a measurement for uh, this one, and the firmware then has an expectation about the next stage. It measures the bootloader. The bootloader, uh, again, measures the kernel, and the kernel me measures the initial RAM disk, and eventually we are at um, um, the operating system at process ID 1. And instead of measuring all those components individually, um, there's this concept of a measurement extension. Um, because if you see in this chart uh, here, we produce a measurement for a confidential virtual machine. It's just one long um, hash. And this is an extended measurement. This means uh, we take an old hash of the prior step and hash it with a new hash. And together, this is um, uh, yeah, the next uh, hash stage. So we, we get an uh, event list, more or less, um, that you cannot reproduce if you I don't know, change the order or anything. <coughs> 
Mm. Then there's remote attestation. Um, as a last uh, concept to introduce, and this is also a key concept of confidential computing. And I think this one also has um, received a bit of press recently, not the good kind, um, because uh, essentially um, the idea is uh, that you have a piece of hardware on your machine that you basically don't control. And this machine is able to, or this piece of hardware is able to make statements about your system that can tra be transferred to a remote uh, service and the remote service can then um, uh, yeah, release or allow a certain workload to proceed. And this is, um, uh, I think if you have a laptop, this could be, I know, an, an ad blocker installation that you cannot visit a website uh, and um, unless you have your uh, hardware claims that you are you have an unmodified installation of uh, of a browser and this I think uh, is um, a pretty valid concern that's been raised that this is uh, potentially removing freedom from users Arguably, in this case, uh, we are not the owners of those machines. Yeah. So remote attestation confidential computing is not that scary, or it actually um, uh, makes a lot of sense because essentially, I think, uh, like people say, it's not um, your VM that's running, it's essentially someone else's computer in the cloud that you're running on and you don't necessarily uh, can trust it. So. If we cut out the platform provider and say we trust the CPU vendor and we trust um, a remote party, um, then we can establish trust without having uh, to trust all the um, uh, components in the middle. And this one has also been standardized in an RFC that is uh, surprisingly readable. It's called the RATS Remote Attestation uh, RFC. And um, in this chart, we can see uh, how, in general, this principle works. So it's this piece of hardware, uh, the TPM or um, secure coprocessor that um, can be used to um, retrieve evidence from the platform. And this contains the measurements we've been talking about, um, and the measurements extend also not just the kernel and the initRD and firmware, but also the whole trusted computing base. And the trusted computing base is a concept that basically means whatever we need to run our workload, um, and our workload uh, is considered the trusted computing base. And this one we want to keep rather small, because if we have add more components, we have to do more measurements, we have to um, trust uh, a bigger surface. So in this chart, we quickly see how this uh, trust establishment uh, could work with remote attestation. So it's a bit simplified um, for brevity, but in principle, it works like this. Um, a user program requests a report about the state of the system. Uh, the secure processor returns a cryptographically signed evidence. The user program then passes this evidence to a relying party, uh, which is holding secrets, and the relying party in, in the background passes it on uh, to a verifier, which makes sure that the report is actually, the signatures on the report are actually um, genuine, and it also compares the evidence claims um, like operating system version, uh, kernel version, etc., cetera, um, with reference values uh, it keeps. And then if all this validation passes, the trust is established and uh, the relying party can provide a secret uh, to our user program. So that's essentially uh, confidential computing. So I, I hope uh, that made a bit of sense.
And now I'm going to talk about uh, confidential containers. So confidential containers uh, we think is interesting uh, because uh, the technology is not trivial to deploy. And the aim of the project is to democratize the use of uh, confidential computing. Essentially, we hope to uh, leverage the, uh, the platform and the abstractions that exist in the cloud native space um, uh, by building on top of them and uh, making it possible for uh, customers to take their workloads and deploy them uh, into a um, TEE with very minimal or even no uh, modifications uh, to their existing code base. So if you look at this, um, this is pretty much uh, what we aim for and what exists today. So you have essentially um, at a, a runtime class to your uh, deployment definition or pod definition. And um, this should be more or less the interface for the user. Uh, so if I want to deploy something in a confidential enclave, I'll add a given runtime class. And ideally, um, uh, the rest is covered by administrators and cloud service providers. And how we do we reconcile um, uh, containers with um, confidential computing? It's essentially that we have to deal with confidential virtual machines. Because the technology that I've um, briefly shown before, essentially these days, is a um, technology that's based on virtual machine uh, technology. Uh, before there were, or there still exist, uh, process-based uh, confidential computing um, implementations, but they're not exactly um, or they don't work without uh, modifications to your code base and the adoption hasn't been uh, that great so far. So what uh, the CPU vendors essentially uh, adopted is um, virtualization as a kind of uh, isolation layer to build confidential computing on. Uh, with a premise to take your existing applications and do minimal or no adjustments. So pretty much what we uh, have in mind for confidential containers. Examples of this would be uh, AMD's SEV technologies, Intel came out with TDX uh, recently, ARM realms are also something like this, and IBM Secure Execution uh, is um, uh, one specific implementation on the IBM side. It has some implications that are tricky because um, this means we have discrete trust domains for CVM hosts and guests. So uh, the CVM guest is actually more like a tenant on, on the host yeah? because the host is being privileged, uh, deprivileged. So to prevent accessing or tampering with the guest's memory, um, uh, we have to uh, introduce certain boundaries. And that's um, tricky uh, to consider in your architecture, as we will see, I think, in the upcoming slide. Yeah. So we'll have um, the problem that we have to reconcile virtual machines and containers first. And if we take a brief look at a very simplified version of what Kubernetes is, it's essentially uh, a cluster that hosts a control plane that has uh, multiple nodes, and the unit of computation is a set of containers that are co-located, you could say. So this is more or less the uh, bird's eye view of Kubernetes. And to uh, reconcile it with confidential uh, VMs, we have the following options. So the first option that is um, uh, pretty uh, obvious is we can just consider Kubernetes as a kind of uh, confidential application in a single TE. So we have multiple nodes. We, we establish trust uh, between them. And then, then we can bootstrap a cluster and just um, consolidate everything um, in a confidential cluster. This is, I think, has uh, the upside of being a very uh, simple model. The downside, I would say, is that um, you cannot 
get this managed from your um, cloud service provider, as, as many customers want, and you also uh, have a rather large TCB, so a lot of software uh, surface is in your trusted computing base. There's the other option of, um, we can just create nodes on CVMs, like have confidential node pools. Um, this looks nice at start, but it also has a problem that um, the control plane pretty much also controls our nodes. So we have the kubelet deployed, we have daemon sets, and those are all items that are not, um, that we don't consider uh, automatically to be trusted. There's the other option of saying, okay, discard uh, pods and nodes and just deploy container groups in CVMs. So solutions that are outside of Kubernetes, um, that works pretty well. Uh, the problem is that you miss out on all the Kubernetes integrations and the ecosystem, and um, it might work for smaller deployments, for larger deployments it's often um, uh, a requirement to have a Kubernetes interface. And finally, um, the, the last option is pretty much to consider pods as the uh, kind of unit that we want to wrap uh, a into a confidential layer. And this is um, what confidential containers is doing. So we want to have uh, pods in uh, confidential VMs. And this, the project of confidential containers, uh, it implements confidential pods. It's a CNCF uh, project. It's pretty um, collaborative uh, at this point. Uh, there's multiple uh, CPU vendors, CSPs, um, Linux vendors, and security uh, companies involved um, to kind of create this um, experience. And uh, the project is mostly implemented in, in Golang and Rust. Golang on the more Kubernetes heavy side, Rust more on the um, upper levels and the um, uh, kata side, I would say, on the virtual machine layer. But there's, I think, an, an equal amount of Golang and Rust in the project. If we go through the individual components, uh, we can first maybe cover um, Kata containers. Because Kata containers it has been picked as a solution that has been used to isolate pods in VMs for quite some time. And um, it's rather mature and proven, so there's multiple major versions been released. It's been tested in, in larger deployments. It supports multiple VMM backends, and uh, it's a natural pick pretty much uh, to do this with Kata containers. And we have a Kubernetes um, a component called the operator, which uh, equips the nodes with the necessary Kata container and uh, binaries and configuration bits. And if we quickly look at the architecture of Kata, uh, it's not trivial. I think that's um, due to the general container stack, but essentially Kata is an implementation of the um, uh, shim uh, runtime v2 API from uh, container D. So it means that um, uh, we can more or less transparently uh, deploy container sandboxes uh, with container D and um, have uh, Kata spawn uh, VMs for us. So like we see here, we have a pod sandbox. It's actually in a VM and those VMs are really lightweight. So the simplest case is really you have a kernel and you have the uh, Kata agent and the Kata agent is the initial RAM disk program pretty much. Yeah, so there's not a big OS or anything. And uh, Kata is facilitating a lot of resources from the host to this guest. 
like the, the container images, uh, devices that uh, need to be accessed, shared volumes uh, from the host. And this um, is a challenge for confidential VMs because this part is untrusted while only this part is trusted. We have another challenge with Kata. Um, that Kata essentially as a, it creates VMs. Uh, we need to um, uh, have uh, the option to um, either run on bare metal nodes, which are uh, quite costly often, or not even available. Um, or we have um, to use nested virtualization, so this means like VMs that are able to host VMs. This is possible with, um, for example, AMD's um, technology in principle, but it's very, very hard uh, to get things like device pass-through, and um, it also has certain performance costs. Um, so this, as an option, is definitely uh, attractive and viable, but it's, it's rather hard and not exactly uh, available today. Um, what we can do, however, is there's a Kata implementation of a remote hypervisor, which instead of spawning a VM locally, you can also um, use a remote uh, VM. So instead of spawning uh, a VM via QEMU, you spawn uh, VM via your cloud API, and this sits next to your uh, uh, pod VM, in quotes. And this one, in Coco, we implement uh, via Cloud API adapter. So the principle is as I described, we have a, a Cloud API adapter as an application that is managing spawning and removal of uh, VMs that host the pods. We don't have the nested virtualization uh, tags in terms of performance, but definitely the startup time is uh, at least the startup time plus the um, time it takes to spawn uh, a cloud VM, which can be uh, around 30 seconds or 45 seconds, depending uh, on circumstances. So we see here, if we start a, uh, such a pod, we pretty much have a virtual pod uh, on our uh, deployment, uh, on our Kubernetes deployment, and then uh, CVM gets spawned that hosts a CATA agent and a forwarder service as uh, system services. Uh, a communication channel is established and the pod sandbox is started um, in the CVM. And from the user side, it should ideally uh, be transparent. Um, uh, the next component want to cover is the uh, attestation agent. Um, this is the one that's performing the measurements that we talked uh, about earlier. So it's a key broker client um, in the project lingo. It's an extension to Kata agent in the trusted execution environment. And we gather platform evidence in a kind of unified fashion because this is very different from how it works in different CPU architectures and even cloud providers um, uh, do it differently. So it's a unified interface um, to facilitate remote attestation and um, trigger a secure key release to a workload. We have the um, attestation service, which is a component that essentially uh, performs uh, the verification that we've seen earlier. So the evidence that we gathered uh, needs to be verified and compared um, against reference values. And for this, uh, at the moment, there's uh, Rego policies, an open policy agent to make sure values are in a certain threshold. If you think maybe of a container image, um, that you're only supposed to use, I know, version upwards 2.0. So this would be an example for an uh, SEV SNP at the station report verification, which involves usually a lot of signatures and crypto operations. 
So uh, first we make sure that the uh, hardware key uh, in the uh, secure processor has actually signed the report. Um, then we have to make sure that uh, AMD signing key has signed the hardware key. And finally, we have to make sure that the AMD root key has actually signed the signing key. So th there's a lot of those uh, verifications in there that essentially give us some, uh, give us confidence that um, whoever produced this evidence is running um, in a trusted execution environment. So uh, you cannot get this report um, uh, via other means. And as a last component, we have uh, KBS, which is a key broker service. That is essentially um, a service that guards secrets. It's called a relying party in, in the red terminology. Um, it could be integrated with the KMS, but for simplification, we could just consider it to be like a, a secret store. And it an attester, so our user workload provides it with evidence. Um, in this uh, chart, we see the relying party hands it off to the verifier, and depending on the result, it will um, release a secret and maybe decrypt a container image or give a, a provide a runtime secret. And in the, the attestation agent has a module that implements um, the interactions with the KBS. And you can, at the moment, retrieve certain secrets. So as I mentioned, image layer decryption keys um, are something that um, makes a lot of sense. Also, application secrets at port runtime. So you maybe want to get a PyTorch image that uh, has no secrets in it, but you want to uh, process secret data with it. So uh, to download it from, I don't know, um, a storage account, you need uh, um, a pre-signed HTTP URL or something like this. Then there's um, credentials for the image registry and image signatures, and the last two are a bit um, uh, controversial because they're not exactly secrets that uh, are... Um, really part of the confidential enclave, but some argue that it's pretty much a function of the infrastructure to provide access to image registry and image signatures essentially are no secret. And this has certain um, security implications. Um, and so they probably might be removed uh, in future revisions. The attestation protocol, um, that the CCKBC client implements, we can see here, it's um, the workload is uh, via some uh, REST uh, interface is talking to a KBS and ask for a secret or ask to be authenticated and the KBS answers with a challenge. So the challenge is also an important part because this means um, we are guarded against replay attacks. So uh, it's really just for this session, um, the attestation is valid because um, this challenge that we received from the server, we have to put into a, the uh, report request. When we go to the secure processor, we can add a certain nonce or report data, and this will be um, put into the report and part of it. And part of the verification would be, is this actually uh, only valid for this session. So in this uh, way, we can establish a secure channel between the KBS and the workload, and we now have established trust. So, and I think we could have time for a demo. So let's do this quickly. So what this looks like is you have a KBS deployment that's running in cluster. Essentially, it could be under your desk or at a different cloud provider. Uh, but um, for demo sake, 
uh, it's running in our cluster. We have um, the encrypted um, container image. Oh, pardon, that's unfortunate. There? Okay. So, not much missed, I think, here. So, we have essentially what we've seen before. Uh, there's a Kata remote runtime class, there's an encrypted image, and We should be. Yeah. So we have seen the cloud API adapter logs, uh, now a virtual machine, like a, a PeerPod VM has been started. We can um, look into the image that we have deployed. And if you s look down here, we have certain annotations on the layers that give us details. So if you... Um, there's a certain uh, key identifier that's associated with the image and uh, metadata, and this means for our um, confidential containers deployment, it encounters this image and it tries to go to KBS, performs a remote at the station, sees am I actually in a uh, confidential VM, and only if this is the case, then uh, provide you with the symmetric key to um, decrypt the image. So, and we've seen it's been successful, so it's running, and what we can do is we can look at the logs. Let's put it down. So, and um, we pretty much see a lot of data that is uh, the exchange that we had before. So the, um, the attestation agent triggered an attestation um, requesting the, the resource and then um, it provided the evidence. So the evidence here is uh, probably raw bytes. There's a bunch of certificates that are included. And then um, this attestation is uh, successful and we are yeah, able to retrieve this key. Um, and this way we, um, we know that the, um, our deployment has actually passed the stages of attestation that we've seen before. Exactly, so if you go back to the presentation. I have to quickly check the time. There's also a longer recording how you encrypt images on the slides if you're interested. It's actually not um, uh, too hard. Uh, but there's definitely uh, some remaining uh, challenges that, I, uh, that we have in the project. And the first one, I think, is um, secure image pulling on the host. That's what I mentioned before. If the host is kind of putting data into the TEE, we have um, issues, uh, and we have to do it in a secure fashion. And this means we have to uh, use certain um, features of, for example, container D, like remote snapshotters that uh, we still are able to share data from the host to the guest, um, maybe via blocks 
for example, so not directly um, sharing um, directories or unpacked um, uh, image layers. Mm, this means we can also get a lot of speed up because uh, if you imagine like a spawn to spawn like 10 replicas of a, uh, of a pod, each one of those has to um, pull an image at the moment and this is uh, quite uh, costly and uh, quite wasteful and also adds to the startup time. And also we need some sort of scratch space, secure scratch space like memory or encrypted disk where actually those contents are, uh, can be buffered. So it's not pretty, um, but there are solutions or I think in the next release even uh, there will be a solution for this. We have the Harrier problem of a Kubernetes control plane, which we have to deprivilege. And uh, because the cluster admin is not supposed to um, interfere with uh, confidential pods, which makes certain assumptions, the Kubernetes code base um, are, are not trivial to, to uh, convert to the confidential setup but uh, it's also a solvable problem, I think. There's like dynamic properties, for example, config maps that are auto-propagating uh, in Kubernetes. So this is very convenient if you want to update your Nginx config for a confidential pod. This means we have a state that has been measured and then suddenly from outside um, it gets overwritten. So it's actually not valid anymore. Do we have to do re-attestation? Do we have to do stop the pod, do we have to block this? So this has to be figured out properly. And finally, all those things have to be measured properly. This is uh, not trivial. Um, and from my experience, there's not a lot of resources on how to do this uh, trivial, like uh, parsing, um, TPM, uh, event logs. Um, this is really an area uh, where there's not a lot of uh, pages on Stack Overflow where you can simply uh, figure out how this works, but often you have to uh, read the spec and, and look at implementations and more. That would be it from my side. And if there's questions, I'd be happy to take them. There's one. Uh, so when you use a cloud VM with Kata containers um, for the network side, is mm -hmm. that completely handled by the pod for the pod for water? Yeah, that's essentially a protocol. Um, I think it's a VXLAN tunnel, a secure one that is uh, negotiated between um, the forwarder and uh, the remote. Um, yeah, the Kata remote uh, hypervisor. Okay. So it means that the cluster could be on premises or in one yes. cloud and the VM could be yeah. somewhere else entirely? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's, there's certainly also networking uh, questions about this. Like, do you want to have performant network? Do you want to have, uh, what is, for example, the, the metadata service you want to associate with this VM? So there's subtleties that are hard, but, um, uh, I think, in general, uh, this, this would work, yeah. Thanks. I, I have a little question, and mm -hmm. is, uh, what is the, the performance using this securitization on the containers? Is an uh, impact on that performance? Because I think ah. it has a cost. Yeah, this is, I think, uh, um, an interesting question because the CPU vendors, I think, are pretty shy about publishing. So if you ask certain people, they will tell you it's 2%, essentially, uh, uh, of what. Yeah. So all of this, for example, means we have uh, assumptions um, like to trust uh, the, the, the disk, for example. So we have to do this, like verification, online verification, DM Verity file systems on Linux. Those have a performance impact. Yeah. 
if you just look at the CPU, maybe it's rather cheap, but uh, security has a certain price. If you have encrypted layers, it's more costly than using non-encrypted layers. So uh, there's definitely a performance hit, but in general, um, it's not uh, prohibitive like, like other encryption methods. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's uh, a question that is implicitly, I think, even now, yeah, you have to trust your CPU vendor. Like, if you do a computation, you have to trust your CPU vendor. What we're doing is essentially this confidential computing. We add another layer on top of it. And, and this closes certain holes, um, but it's definitely, uh, you still, there's still trust in the hardware. I think, um, in general, the, the CPU vendors are pushed to release um, the firmware to those um, CPUs and essentially those um, pro protocols as open source. So you can read up on them and I don't, make a review of the, the PSP firmwares. Uh, those things are possible, but probably also for small uh, amount of knowledgeable folks. <laughs> Can it be applied to more scenario than just computing? Or can it, can it be the default, uh, default configuration for general containers? So how much cost for, for ah. this? So if I understood the question, it's more like about costs, yeah? So it, it, essentially what it also is with Kubernetes, it's a bin packing problem, yeah? So you will probably have some waste there. What is, for example, in the uh, there are certain facilities in Kubernetes where you have um, can configure pods in a way that there, there's hints to which um, VM needs to be spawned, for example. And then we can have cer certain profiles and say, I need a memory-intensive application needs this kind of instance, and it's not so important uh, that it has like a lot of CPU cores. And this is uh, the domain of the cloud API adapter, which uh, for yeah, managers um, the allocation of those resources, but it's definitely like always the, a bin packing problem. Yeah. Monitoring? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, uh, actually, this is uh, f for me a very interesting topic because I've been working in observability for, uh, for a long time. And this is uh, something that, I mean, observability and, and confidentiality don't mix very well. So we have to, we have to pretty much, uh, uh, I think, figure out the model for those concepts. At the moment, I don't have a good answer. I would say, like, just expose. Uh, metric endpoints um, is maybe not problematic, but uh, I know I, it's definitely an issue like with APM monitoring. Yeah? You get a lot of insights if you deploy, I don't know, a data dog new relic agent into your application. This would definitely subvert uh, your TEE. Um, so I think, um, yeah, those models have to be figured out for uh, confidential uh, computing in general, not just confidential pods, but uh, I, I think it's an interesting problem to solve. Okay. I see. 
think that's it. So thanks a lot for listening and uh, the questions.